This is Andrea Kane, and I'm here with you for HIT 445 Quality Management. This is still week two, and we have moved on to chapter eight. Yes, we are skipping chapter seven. We will come back for that in a couple of weeks, but chapter eight, refining the continuum of care. You know, we've talked a lot about continuum of care in the HIT program, so this is not a new concept for us, um, but we're here to just kind of give ourselves a brief review. And also maybe um, spend an extra moment or two on case management. So let's let's just fly through this chapter together. So we know that consumers are demanding more extensive and complete healthcare services in the hoping of improving the quality and longevity of their lives. Third-party payers, both private and governmental, are trying to maximize profits, minimize costs, and address healthcare fraud. Public and private purchasers, such as businesses, buying health insurance for their employees are looking for comprehensive coverage at affordable rates. Physicians are struggling to pay for insurance premiums for their businesses. Many of them have, um, you know, allowed themselves to become employed by large healthcare organizations because of that. Healthcare organizations are trying to make a positive contribution to the health of their communities and still remain profitable. They have to be. If they aren't profitable, they will not be around. And we continue to see hospitals close every year across the United States. Um, if you are curious, go out and Google hospital closures 2020 or hospital closures 2019, and you will be really surprised to see the list of hospitals that come up. The overall goal of U.S. Healthcare, of the U.S. healthcare system is to achieve equilibrium between health and spending. Whether or not that goal is realistic um, remains anyone's argument either way. Utilization review is the process of determining whether medical care provided to a specific patient is necessary based on pre-established objective pre screening criteria at time frames specified in the organization's utilization management plan. Um, I would also argue that utilization review is the process of determining whether medical care provided to a specific patient is necessary based on their diagnoses according to the payer. <laughs> Um, it's no longer just the organization's utilization management plan or the utilization screening criteria. It is down to um, payers these days. Payers can say, I, that patient shouldn't be an inpatient. You need to move them back to an OBS um, and, and treat them accordingly. Um, I've, I've seen that in my world for a number of years. There have been efforts to align payment with quality of care. That's where you see the pay for performance programs come into play or the value-based purchasing. You've got the hospital readmission reduction program. You've got the HAC program or the HAI program where health-acquired in infections are targeted. Um, you've got um, all those other things um, that they are there trying to um, shift payment based on to value based on the rather than based on what care was provided to the patient. So value-based purchasing programs, we talked through hospital, we've talked through hospital outpatient, physician practice, ambulatory surgery center, and stage renal disease, inpatient psychiatric, PPS, exhibit cancer hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, and home health. Remember last semester we had HIT, give me a second here, it is the one that we studied um, not only comparative records with, but we also looked at reimbursement systems. So almost all this information that they're giving to us here in this chapter, we've already covered, and I know you remember it, right? So you've got case management who's reviewing the condition of patients to identify each patient's care needs and integrating the patient data with the patient's course of treatment. You've got utilization management who is reviewing for medical necessity and appropriateness, improving patient outcomes, decreasing healthcare spending. Um, you've got the pre-admission care planning that happens a lot of times when you've got um, scheduled surgeries or inpatient, uh, anticipated inpatient admissions. Um, example might be a delivery, um, could be an orthopedic procedure like a hip or knee replacement, those types of things. Then you've got care planning at the time of admission where they identify, oh, is this patient going to need home health after they leave? Are they going to need skilled nursing care? Um, are they going to need, based on their diagnoses and complications, comorbidities, are they going to need a couple of extra days? Are we going to be able to get them out fairly quickly? Do they have good family support? 
um, those types of things. And then you've got the progress of care where they're checking, making sure nothing's changed, making sure that everything's ready for discharge. And then you've got the discharge planning. And I would argue that if you don't, if you don't start discharge planning the day of admission, you are a very foolish healthcare organization. Um, when the patient's admitted based on the H and P and what they know about that patient, they should be assigning a DRG to that, a tentative DRG, a work what you would call a working DRG. That should have an attached length of stay to it, and that should be put up on the patient's white dry erase board in their room. That we anticipate your discharge to be this day based on your situation. If that changes, we'll let you know, um, and start getting that ball rolling so that the patient understands that their expectation is we're going to get you the care that you need, but we're going to make sure that we get you out um, as soon as we possibly can for your safety and um, so that you can pursue health. And then, of course, they conclude the post-discharge planning. They make sure the information goes to wherever it needs to go if the patient needs care after discharge, whether that is to their um, primary care physician, if they're going home, the home health agency, if they need home health care, the skilled nursing facility, if they're being transferred there, all those types of things. Some toolbox techniques. And let's see, I think I've flown through most of this because you can read about it here in your book. And like I said, we covered it again and again between comparative records and um, reimbursement systems last semester. Um, let's see here. We're now up to page 143. Indicators, these are performance measures that, in, that enable healthcare organizations to monitor a process to determine whether it is meeting requirements. Um, the criteria may be established and implemented internally, externally, or generically, and it goes through all of that. Talks about intensity of service and severity of illness. Uh, make sure you know what those are. That, that's very important. Um, that is what case management is looking at. What is the severity of this patient's illness? How sick are they? How much are they going to need to take care of them? And then intensity of service is the type of services or care that the patient's going to require. So severity of illness, how sick are they? Intensity of service, how much are we going to have to do to get them better, to resolve their situation or at least stabilize them so that they can move on to their next level of care in the continuum? Um, talks about ratios, looking at the number of admissions being criteria over the total number of admissions. Um, goes through the uh, next couple of pages and talks about, uh, gives you examples of hospital standard measures, which I think is well worth looking at. It's not going to be on your quiz, but make sure you take a look at that. And then Gantt charts are on page 146. This is a project management tool used to schedule important activities. Gantt charts divide a horizontal scale into days, days, weeks, or months in a vertical scale into project activities or tasks. They're used in clinical process improvement activities to depict clinical guidelines or critical pathways in the treatment of common medical conditions. So make sure you know what Gantt charts are. Um, try and take a look at a couple. Um, Google those. Make sure you're familiar with those. Um, I don't know. It doesn't look like they give you an example of a Gantt chart here, but I'm sure before it's all said and done, we'll have some examples that we look at between this class and HIT 452 where we get into statistics and whatnot and data analytics. All right. Well, there was indicators and Gantt charts, and that is the end. I will be back um, with one more lecture video for week two, which will be on Chapter 9.